G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. You hear a lot of bullshit about journalists in the Vietnam War. How about we dispel some of that bullshit? All of this happened in a little place called Southeast Asia. I wasn't afraid of being killed, but I really didn't want to be wounded and lie out there with a gut full of shrapnel. I'd seen a lot of wounded soldiers die like that, and I didn't care for it at all. On the morning of 9 September 1985, I began to write up the opening chapter of a biography of Neil Davis. The Tasmanian-born cine cameraman and war correspondent had been sending me tapes of reminiscences to swell a growing pile of tapes and transcripts but I had a sudden, almost panicky desire to make a start. The process of research and collecting can go on for too long. The irony of beginning his life story on the day he died would have amused Neil Davis if he ever could have known. He liked those crazy, fateful coincidences. He would have told the story with gusto over a drink in the Grand Prix bar in Pat Pong Road, Bangkok. That bloody Bowden! Bastard was actually writing my epitaph when I copped it. I was, too. I typed the heading, quote, Attitudes to Fate and Death, and turned to the many hours of tape we had recorded over the previous two years to find the quotes I wanted. I did become addicted to combat after experiencing my first three years of frontline action in Vietnam. It was exhilarating, much the same as playing a good hard game of football or catching the big fish. It was testing your skill and faculties, physical and mental, against a given situation or an opponent. It is a time of heightened perception. I was never afraid in action. I was apprehensive many times and very excited. But when I got used to it, I used to look forward to combat. The soft, distinctive voice of this quiet Australian paused and continued. There's the oft-repeated thing, any man who says he's not afraid is a fool. But I think fear means that you can't handle things, that you lie down and whimper or something. I felt very confident I could handle any situation, partly because I developed an extra sense, instinct if you like, which wild animals have and which we have lost in our so-called civilised life. You will see a dog react to certain situations and wonder if it had a premonition. That's what becomes addictive, and it was exhilarating, like going into overdrive on a car. On occasions I have instinctively dropped to the ground before a shot was fired. But not on the morning of 9 September 1985. Thai coups were not uncommon but were a damn nuisance when you were just about to go on holidays. Cursing the Thai's abominable sense of timing, Davis resplendent in the bright red socks he had taken to wearing on all occasions, pulled on a pair of dark green pants and lighter green shirt and began the methodical checking of his camera gear. Neil Davis had filmed combat in the Indochina War for 11 years from 1964 and had recorded and witnessed extraordinary events. He worked for the British International News Film, Co News Film Company, Viz News, and later for the American television network, NBC. Unlike most other Western cine cameramen, he had consistently filmed the fighting efforts of the Vietnamese and Cambodian soldiers. His viewfinder had framed their pain, anguish and action, and begun the process of projecting it to the world. After the fall of Saigon, which he stayed to film, he had continued to cover Asia for NBC, adding Africa and the Middle East to his areas of operation. I had known him in Tasmania and had worked with him in Southeast Asia during the mid-1960s. Our paths had diverged, but I nourished a long-term plan to write his autobiography, or to write his biography. Neil Davis was a byword among foreign correspondents, universally liked in a competitive profession not without intense personal jealousies. Tall, blonde and always looking 10 years younger than his real age, he won the Singapore-based Biz News job in 1963. He moved from the cold, windswept beauty of Tasmania to base himself in the smaller, fully tropical island of Singapore. It was the beginning of a passionate love affair with Asia and its people. He sent his first film out of Saigon in April 1964, when American Secretary of State Dean Rusk toured the allegedly Viet Cong-controlled areas of the Mekong Delta region. It was almost as though the Vietnam War had been waiting for Neil Davis to arrive, although he was no lover of violence. 
When you are in danger of losing your life, all pretensions are stripped away. Irritating little facets to a person's character don't matter anymore. It's what kind of human being he is and whether he does his job. When I was with Vietnamese and Cambodian soldiers, I found a feeling of comradeship and sympathy that even extended across the line to the other side, even in the most desperate frontline situations. I found that very rewarding. He lost count of the number of times he was wounded, more than 20, but only six of those he considered serious. People have sometimes said to me, what does it feel to be a living legend? I know that behind my back, not to my face, I've been called Suicide Davis or Death Wish Davis. The Death Wish tag has stayed with me. One of my great friends, Jim Bennett, an American television correspondent, once put people to rights on that one. I was not present at the time when he said, well, he hasn't got a death wish, and that's very easily proven. He's still alive. It was 9.30am in Sydney, 6.30am in Bangkok. There were tanks in the streets. Cursing the rebels' timing and thinking wistfully of his now delayed holiday in Vanuatu, New Zealand and Australia, Davis shouldered his camera gear and teamed up with his sound man, Bill Latch. Latch, an American married to a Thai, had been taking his daughter to school when he saw the tanks and raised the news alert. If this job had not come up, Davis had planned to go to the Cambodian border that day to meet Anne Veng, his former Cambodian sound man and driver in Phnom Penh. Anne Veng had managed to get out to a refugee camp after 10 desperate years under the Pol Pot and Vietnamese regimes. It would have been an emotional reunion. News of a Thai coup was not enough to get Davis's adrenaline pumping. Somewhat seasonal in character, they were generally relatively bloodless affairs, with the losers rather sportingly being allowed to fly out of the country, bracket returning discreetly sometime later. Davis and Latch teamed up with a Bangkok-based Viz News cameraman Gary Burns, also an Australian, and his Thai sound man, Dayeng Karia. Neil Davis had become a victim of changing technology. He had always worked by himself in dangerous situations, not only because he was a natural loner, but because he did not want the responsibility of making life and death, de death decisions for others. In Vietnam, he filmed combat with a cassette tape recorder strapped to his waist and a compact handheld bell and howl spring-loaded camera. For less hectic sound-on film work, he shouldered his CP-16 Comag sound-on film camera and managed his own sound, but the switch to videotape had put the clock back in his terms. For the last six years of his reporting life, he needed a sound man to shoulder the heavy battery and cassette pack linked to the nine kilogram camera by a video cable. Working independently, Gary Burns and Neil Davis took shots of tanks in the streets. They met at the rebel-held First Division radio station compound in Fitzanuloki Road. As the dissidents continued to broadcast from inside, tanks assembled in the road outside. The newsmen filmed loyalist Thai soldiers setting up machine gun nests. Then, in a lull, Bangkok's morning peak hour traffic took over again with the usual parade of taxis, Honda motorbikes, trucks and bicycles weaving their way between the tanks and the radio station. The two crews decided to send back their early coverage tape cassettes by taxi to their offices, and Davis cadged his traditional cigarette from Burns. It was a ritual that he never bought his own, close bracket. They sent one of the drivers to buy Cokes and Munch some breakfast bananas while they watched the cluster of tanks and about 20 soldiers on the other side of the road. According to Gary Burns, there was no sign of any danger when, quote, suddenly a machine gun opened up, firing at the radio station directly behind us. We grabbed our gear and the first inclination was to run. Unfortunately, my sound man ran the wrong way, to the left, which took us right in front of three of the tanks. In hindsight, if we'd run to the right, we would have been clear of the tanks and the soldiers very quickly. Davis stayed beside the two telephone booths to film the outbreak of firing. Taking what cover he could behind a small metal telephone junction box, Burns looked along the road to see Davis up on one knee and filming. I thought, oh shit, if he's filming, I've got to film. I switched the camera on and poked it out from behind the telephone junction box, but I was still behind cover. Davis was out in the open for at least a minute and a half before the tanks opened up with their cannons. During the brief lull before the tanks opened up, Davis and Latch ran over to join the Viz News crew behind the metal junction box. Then all hell broke loose as machine guns, tanks, cannons and automatic weapons were fired at the radio station. The four men, yoked in pairs with the camera gear and cables, were desperate for cover, crammed in behind the junction box, which was barely a metre high. 
They were firing directly into the gate and wall behind us, says Burns. It was utter pandemonium. The street filled with smoke and the sound tapes were saturated with cannon and machine gun fire. Gary Burns noticed blood on Davis's arm as he tried to pull him closer in behind the small metal box. Jesus, you're hit, he said. No, I'm all right, I'm all right, said Davis, and showed his arm. It was just a scratch. An unbelieving Gary Burns saw Davis preparing to film again. Even though machine gun bullets and cannon shells were screaming overhead and exploding against the wall behind them, Burns says, I could feel him there. He was lying across the lower half of my body. I had Bill Latch on the other side of me, which as it turned out meant that I was perfectly protected and they copped the shrapnel. The firing was so intense I felt we were all going to die. I was lying there trying to get through cracks in the pavement. You want to return to Mother Earth. I felt some close rounds came in, come in and we all shook and shuddered. I didn't feel Neil hit. There was a brief lull and the newsmen started screaming to the tank crews to let them get out. But the firing started again and continued for another five minutes. It seemed longer. Another pause and this time one of the soldiers on the nearest tank signalled them to get away quickly. Gary Burns said to Davis, come on mate, let's get out of here. He says, I half pushed Neil and he rolled over. His head just lolled back in front of me, his eyes rolled back, he was quite obviously dead. I went to pull him back and it was just like one of those horror things, his whole side had opened up and spilled out onto the pavement. He'd been virtually cut in half by shrapnel. Stark footage, soon to flash around the world, relayed what may be termed the ultimate television story. Always the complete professional, Neil Davis had filmed his own death. His head, astonishingly, almost in focus, appeared in front of his own lens. Then as Gary Burns began to pull him away at enormous personal risk, Davis's running camera tilted over on its side. His mortally wounded sound man Bill Latch hit him the stomach and legs, was filmed desperately crawling away as Gary Burns attempted to rescue Davis's body. His still rolling camera also showed tank cannons still inexplicably firing seemingly at them. Other cameras showed the ghastly blood trail from Davis's terrible wounds staining the ground as he was dragged along. They are searing images. It was 10.30 a.m. in Bangkok. In Sydney, not knowing what had happened, I continued running through the tapes in which Davis described his own attitudes to fate and death. Some of my friends have categorised me as being foolhardy, suicidal, but I believe myself to be a methodical and careful person, admittedly with a streak of impetuousness at time, but I think most people have that. Perhaps there is a paradox here, I have a motto, I picked it up from somewhere. It says, hence the title, simply one crowded hour of glorious life is worth an age without a name. By early evening, the television pictures had been bounced from satellites around the world. Neil Davis's death was a bigger story than the half-hearted coup he was covering. In news world, say again, in newsrooms throughout the world, hardened professionals gasped in equivalent shock. It was impossible that the charm Davis that laughing cavalier of the camera should be dead. The New York Times published a three-column obituary. Although worldwide television audiences had seen thousands of metres of his Indochina coverage during the 11 years of war, it took David Bradbury's award-winning documentary Frontline to make people aware of Neil Davis and his extraordinary achievements. Frontline highlights Neil Davis's most celebrated crowded hour of glorious life when he took his exclusive footage of the North Vietnamese tanks crashing down the gates of Saigon's presidential palace on 30 April 1975. To cover such stories, Davis had to sustain his technical and artistic skills in violent and unpredictable surroundings. Despite such actions of great skill and courage, it is the lot of the cine cameraman to be submerged beneath the impact of his own work. Essentially a modest man, this was no, of no great concern to Neil Davis. The opinion of his peers meant more to him than any public recognition, and he need not have had no doubt about that. May 1967, Mekong Delta with Vietnamese troops. On patrol with Arvin troops, Mekong Delta, 1972. Drinking from a Vietnamese helmet. With handheld bell and howl, Neil Davis in action, Mekong Delta, 1967. He's actually airborne in the photograph. Cambodian press card, 1970. If they don't let it, if we don't let them in, they cry. Cambodian boy soldiers, 1970. Davis helping carry a wounded Cambodian. Davis interviewing President Lon Nol, 1972. 
recording sound, Cambodia 1970, with Cambodia's 53 year old Friar Tuck, below that, 1973, 51 year old fighting monk Friar Tuck. In moments of extreme danger and tension, Khmer soldiers put the image of Buddha worn around their necks into their mouths. Davis having spotted a pretty girl filming his own death. Ciao.